Welcome to 90% Native. I'm Michelle and I garden in Virginia, Northern Virginia, in Zone 7A. And today I want to take you on a tour of my woodland garden. For the most part it is gone over now, but if you take a look at my throwback garden tour video from May of 2020, you'll see what it looks like in its full glory. So let me take you on a tour of the woodland garden. So this is the start of my woodland garden. So first up over here is my Jack in the Pulpit patch that stays really nice until about the beginning of July. Now it's totally gone over and the only thing left of the Jack in the Pulpit are the seed heads. The Jack in the Pulpit leaves, they get really messy and untidy so I like to pull those out and just leave the seeds in there. And I will use the seeds to germinate new plants. I'll leave some for the birds. And I will also leave some to self sow. So down here, that's a seed head that's ready to harvest. The bright red, it's just so beautiful. And then the chartreuse seed head that is ripening up now. So what I do have left in this bed, I've been working on for a little while to make sure that I am getting um, some coverage over the ground and interest. I have Christmas fern right here. I've planted in a bunch of Christmas fern. So the Christmas fern is actually really great in this spot because it can handle being under the big jack in the pulpit leaves and then when the jack in the pulpits die back because they are a spring ephemeral then the christmas fern are there and ready to give their show for a little bit i also have golden alexanders so the golden alexanders now have gone over they start blooming in the middle of march here and they have fantastic blooms that shoot up are the embellifer type blooms and that are bright yellow so if you want something that resembles Queen Anne's waist, but is yellow, the Golden Alexander is a great plant. It's also the larval host plant for the, for the swallowtail butterflies, which means that the swallowtails will lay their eggs on the leaves. And when those eggs hatch and the caterpillars emerge they have the leaves of the golden alexanders to eat i have tons of swallowtails in my yard because i also have a lot of tulip poplar trees which is another larval host plant for the swallowtails in the spring there's just a beautiful show of jack in the pulpits and then the golden alexander leaves stay under the leaves of the jack in the pulpits but the blooms shoot up above the leaves and when it the wind is lightly blowing, they just sway back and forth. And I'll put a link into a, my other garden tour that was a throwback um, so that you can see what this woodland garden looks like in the early spring. And then over here on this side in front of the deck, I have Carex flaccosperma. This is a blue leaf Carex. I really love it. Sometimes it looks a little untidy, um, I cut it back once a year. Other Carex species that I have um, in more formal locations, I'll cut those back twice. Once in the very, very late winter and once after they um, put out their seed heads. And then behind that, I have a patch of bottle gentian. These are so cool. So bottle gentian has these blue, purple, blooms that just resemble the old school Christmas lights or even the Christmas lights you see outdoors now. They're just so cool. And then so the only pollinators that can actually get in there to pollinate the flowers are bumblebees. You have to have a strong pollinator to get in there. I'd love to capture it on video sometime. But, and whoop, there's stilt grass. Gotta get that out. And the painter's palette. Okay. But you can see 
the nubs here all over, that's deer damage, deer browse. This year is, I think this is the first year I've had so many bottled gentian bloom. I think maybe because the plants are getting bigger and having more of a stand. So behind the bottled gentian, I have Joe Pye weed, and now, hey girl, hey girl, what's that doing? <laughs> So behind the bottle gentians, I have Joe Pye weed. Now, if you want a plant to replace invasive butterfly bush, get yourself some Joe Pye weed. The swallowtails flock to this. The pollinators absolutely love it. Mine have gone over or have almost gone over at this point. You can see here the seed heads. I'll probably be collecting some of those seeds soon. And then some of the blooms that are still there, let's see, a little bit. For the most part, they've gone over <clears throat> as far as beautiful blooms go, but that is a great plant to replace the butterfly bush. And then I have a little bit of a hedgerow right here. These are all shrubby St. John's wort. I grew them from seed. They're about three years old. The Latin name is Hypericum prolificum. And if you know me, you know I absolutely love these. You can plant them anywhere, in the sun, in the shade, it's wet, it's dry, it doesn't matter. And then they have these beautiful yellow blooms that the bumble bumblebees love. Then here I have a teepee of Virginia clematis. Has some deer brows on it. And then I have a few big blue stems right here that I grew from seed. Violet likes to eat the grass. It's great. Don't ya? <laughs> okay, so this is the big blue stem. And then right here we had an oak tree that sadly we had to take down last year because it was dead. But there was kind of a hole that went underneath it. And so I've just been propping up some sticks to make um, shelter for uh, the wildlife. Come on, bye. Okay, over here is another TP of Virginia clematis, Virgin's Bower, and then here I have Christmas fern. Oh, this is another favorite of mine. This is green and gold, and this forms a carpet on the ground, which is fantastic for green mulch to keep that dirt covered because that's what you want. You don't need to be showing off your mulch. Put something, put carrots down, put green and gold down, put plants like that down and, and cover the cover the earth, keep it moist, keep it cool. The sweet woodruff is not a native of the US. This I inherited and I am slowly pulling it out over time. It's not bothering me too much and it's not too invasive. I don't work on it that much. On the other side of the path, which is still in the jack in the pulpit patch uh, are sensitive fern. I love these. They are a little bit unruly, which is okay. Um, eventually I may move them to a, um, a better place, a little farther back. Good girl. Good girl, yeah. Okay, here's more green and gold. And then I have back here, white wood aster. And it goes all the way back and around. And it's mixed in with some clustered mountain mint. But the deer get the white wood aster and typically they get the white wood aster uh, and they don't take it down too much this year there was a lot of deer pressure on the white wood aster so uh, I might need to spray it a little bit more next year but I'm going to take you back to this one because you can see it a little bit better and here you can see that the um, interior of the blooms can be pink or yellow and this is the way the plant communicates to the pollinators to tell them whether there is nectar and pollen in the blooms. So if it's yellow, the pollinators will continue to feed off those blooms. But if it's pink, they will pass right over it. Okay, going down in this big patch, this is the white wood aster and the clustered mountain mint. There's also Joe Pye weed and then non-native astilbe. And then in front of that, a carpet of green and gold, carpet of green and gold on either side of the path. And then in the spring on this side of the path, this is completely covered. You can't see any bare spots of mayapple. 
And if you've never had May apple, I highly suggest bringing it into your shade garden. It's a, a super cool plant. So then I have Christmas fern and then I have a patch of hay scented or New York fern, which came from a huge patch further down in the woodland and is probably not the plant for that location. So first off, you can see that because it's the end of August, the ferns are going, that fern um, is going over, the Hay Senate or New York fern. So it also spreads really fast. So if you put Hay Senate or New York fern in your landscape, you can expect it to spread. So I'm probably gonna remove that, move it around the yard, give some away, and put something here that's not going to push everything out. There's a lot of other plants I have in here like big leaf aster and spider warts and I have um, Hypericum prolificum and some different carexes and I don't want this fern to take over um, those native plants. And then I have a couple non-native azaleas, which is fine because the deer will nibble on them and if the deer can nibble on these and stay away from some of my other native plants, so be it. Okay, back to this side of the patch, I have a witch hazel, and you can see it's caged. Um, the deer are starting to eat the top leaves and stems, so I am going to have to lift that cage and to keep the deer off of it. I'm going to do that on a lot of my caged native trees um, pretty soon here. But back in here, we have Christmas fern and Carex blanda and more Hypericum prolificum or shrubby St. John's wort. This area right here was completely covered in Jack in the Pulpit and now you can see it's bare. Over the past couple years, I've been putting cuttings of green and gold down in here so that hopefully eventually it will form a carpet, a mat, so that when the Jack in the Pulpits go back, then that's just completely covering the, the ground. Okay, and then over in this little spot, I have hellebore, which is not native, Christmas fern, non-native is still be, Carex blanda. There should be a virgin sour on here, and I'm wondering if it is not getting enough sun because it's really small down there. Okay, so we have green and gold. Uh, wherever you see the red seed heads, that's where Jack and the pulpits were pretty much covering the, the beds until just recently. Then we have Whitewood Aster about to put on a big show down here if I can keep the deer off of it. Oh, this is a fantastic plant. Right here, this is a native Pachysandra. There is absolutely no reason to plant the Japanese Pachysandra because that's invasive. And when we have a native that is actually way more beautiful, look at how layered those leaves are on top of each other. And then in the spring, they produce the most beautiful, interesting blooms. You wouldn't even believe it's a native. Blooms so much prettier than the Japanese version. However, the native version does grow quite a bit slower. This area here, you see I have Christmas fern, and then you can see the where the Jack of the Pulpits were. Also, I have a pretty big stand of Solomon seal right here and then ginger right here but unfortunately the deer eat it and so it's not there providing any ground cover so I'm still working on getting more Christmas fern in there and um, plants that can handle the deer pressure a little bit better and then in the front that usually is all jack of the pulpit so I've added some new Carex this year. I grew from seed called Carex grizzia. I'm really excited about these ones. If any of you watch Roy Diblick or have any of his books, this is a Carex that he recommends, which I didn't even know because I didn't start following him until recently. But um, one of his YouTube videos, he spotlighted the Carex grizzia. And it's also in his one of his books that I have the well-maintained perennial garden, I believe. Here's some non-native runnera, which the deer don't really seem to bother. I wish this was a native. <laughs> the leaves are so beautiful. And then golden ragwort. Probably just one of the best workhorses in the native plant garden. 
the golden ragworts will take over an area and fight off invasives. Really, really good plant to use to fight stilt grass. Any of those invasives, they will self seed. And in the spring, they bloom early in the spring and they shoot up spike. And on the end of that spike are little purple beads. They're the buds and it's so cool looking. And then the, the blooms open up and they're bright yellow. So just such an interesting plant. In here, I have Tiarella. It never has seemed to do that well here. So I think that this is on the dry side and I'm gonna to have to find some other plants that are okay in the dry, in this dry location to fill in. Um, over here, we have lady fern that are obviously going over. Now we got carrot black asperma popped in everywhere. Here's a caged red bud. So I have a couple caged red buds really close to these Kusa dogwoods. I inherited the Kusa dogwoods when we bought the house. This Kusa, the Kusa dogwoods are beautiful trees. However, they are not native and they provide no wildlife value. They have berries and they fall to the ground, but their berries are so big and the wildlife, for instance, like the birds or the small mammals, they don't eat them. So hopefully someday these red buds, red buds that I have caged close to the Kusas will take their place. And then this is a patch of lady fern that's going over, Carex wacosperma, hookara. Um, there are a lot of native blue violets in here. And then when we come down here, I have a dry creek bed and I dug this out this year because I had a drainage problem. And then it, I have it lined with lyre leaf sage, which is su such a show in the late spring. It is just beautiful. I've popped in some great blue lobelias um, and cardinal flowers and things like that for next year so that I can get um, another show later in the season. Uh, and I also have some wood reed grass that I'm trying out this year that just looks really beautiful. Let me find the pot or some right here. And it's supposed to get up to three feet tall. So I have a couple patches of those. But anyway, in the cages that going into the dry creek bed and right up to the dry creek bed those are button bushes they can basically live in standing water so i made the dry creek bed so that it would saturate those button bushes and then around my yard you'll see all these uh, wood piles and what we do is when we have big limbs fall down we get the chainsaw and cut the limbs and make little wildlife habitat areas. Also great for the birds because they can get a meal off of there. This right here I'll go into later. This is what I call, I don't know if it's an actual thing, but it is a wildlife waddle fence. And what I did is I just got stakes and I put the stakes up at specific intervals and I'm filling it with filling the in between with branches with uh, small branches so that the insects have a place to live the birds can come have a meal um, and so I might be doing this in a few other places too if it's successful and it's it's like really easy to do then right here should be a big patch of tiarella and carexes but what hap what has happened in the past is up here right here the water comes surging down after storms. We have big storms in the spring. Comes surging down and it, this whole lawn area was really boggy and then it was washing out all my Tiarella. So that's why I did the dry creek bed. And I can see that the Tiarella is starting to come back and I'm hoping it looks more carpet-like throughout the whole bed next year, just like this. And then intermixed with the Carex, this is Carex Sprengali, and then I have Carex, I'm just gonna call it Carex R because it's either Rosia or Radiata, I got them mixed up. And then here's some of the wood reed, wood reed grass winter sowed from seed this year. So they're about, it's about, I don't know, 12 to 18 inches tall. The leaves look really pretty. I think this is gonna be a good landscape plant. We'll see what it does next year, but, 
Oh, and then right here I have Virginia water leaf, which is an ephemeral. So I want, that is supposed to spread really well. So this is a moist area. I want it to spread in all of the bare patches. So hopefully I have solved my water and drainage issues this year in this particular spot so that these areas start to fill in and the, the bald and bare areas decrease. I know that mowing the lawn back here is significantly easier now that I have this dry creek bed and then I did a mini one on the other side of the path. Okay, so this area right here is one I want to point out. This plant right here is called Virginia Jump Seed. Let me just take it and it looks like fireworks in the woodland. I'm just absolutely loving this. And what was here before, this was all invasive plants. And what I did, I tore them all out. And I didn't backfill anything. I just tore them all out to see what would come. Well, what do you know? Like they say, as soon as you tear out the invasives, the natives will come back. And boy, did they ever. Jump seed is a spreader that's fine with me this is in the woodland and look how beautiful the show is I do have a jump seed that is not native that I pull out it's called painters palette I think it's a Japanese variety of persicaria or jump seed what I'm really excited about here not only the show that the jump seed has been putting on every year but also my neighbor next door thinned out some of her ostrich fern and gave me a bunch and so I'm hoping this whole area in the middle fills in with ostrich fern and just I mean comparing the texture and the shape of the leaves between the the jump seed and the ostrich fern and the color the chartreuse to the hunter green I think it's gonna look fabulous in the long run and then behind me this is where we'll wrap it up for the day there's more to the woodland garden but we can cover that another day what I do want to show you is my bird sanctuary and I have the bird sanctuary fenced. This is the very first year that the deer have not gone into my bird sanctuary. And that is thanks to a couple of my good gardening friends that came over and helped rebuild this fencing. Because in previous years, the deer would jump over it, bust through it. <laughs> they would do anything. They would get in there and they would get, and they would eat down the plants. And these plants have never looked so good and I know that it's a hassle to have this type of fence but if you do want to experience some of those natives that the deer eat then you know do something like this because you'll appreciate it I definitely am just in love with it I need to paint spray paint the tops of the the tea stakes and then this area will be pretty much done but what I have in here I have cinnamon fern around the front Behind that, I have clustered mountain mint. And I don't know if you can see this, but somehow I have great blue lobelia that self-seeded itself here in the bird garden, which is fantastic because the hummingbirds like the great blue lobelia and the swallowtails do. And it's just so much fun to see where my native plants end up throughout the landscape where I didn't plant them. But anyway, there's a few great blue lobelias. We got the clustered mountain mint, uh, viburnum dentatum right here. And then I have high bush blueberry. Okay, this is the first year I actually had blueberries, three blueberries, because the deer didn't get my high bush blueberries and eat them down to nubs. And came out one day, the next day the blueberries were gone. And so the birds were able to enjoy at least three this year. So super happy about that. Over to the side here, I have jewelweed, which I actually transplanted um, from back by the jump seed. And the jewelweed is a fantastic plant for the hummingbirds. And if you want the hummingbirds and you have a shady, wet spot, then jump seed is for you. Or I'm sorry, jewelweed is for you. And just know going into it that jewel weed will spread. It will spread like crazy. So you gotta be able to maintain it. 
Um, I have a witch hazel in there for winter interest. It's small, but it's looking beautiful compared to previous years because the deer haven't eaten it. And then back here, I have my elderberry trees. I had started with three, well, shrubs, trees. Um, I started with three, but I put so many more in just because in the winter, you can take just a branch, cut off a, a branch like 12 inches or so and stick it right into the ground in the middle of winter and you will have a new elderberry tree. It's fantastic. I had a few huge bunches of elderberries in there and it looks like the birds are just about finished with them. It looks like I have about a third left on the last bunch that still has berries on it. And then my favorite part of the garden right now absolute favorite i have a favorite part like every couple weeks but right here i have my woodland sunflowers i have never had woodland sunflowers a stand like this they're even climbing up into the elderberries and then you have the purple elderberries with the yellow woodland sunflower blooms it just i mean that's perfect purple and yellow complement each other every year these have been eaten down by the deer and they're just they're just putting on a magnificent magnificent show this year and I'm absolutely thrilled with it. So here is the bird garden lined with carrots, placosperma. Just never having looked better. Just so so happy with this this year. Those woodland sunflowers are going to provide so much food for the goldfinches and the hummingbirds with the jewelweed and the great blue lobelia and then the songbirds get the elderberries and the blueberries so, so this is a dream of mine to have this area for the birds and just see them thriving in my yard and that to the side is a bluebird a bluebird box i think we've had two brews this year so anyway this is where i'm going to end the tour for now Well, that's it for the Woodland Garden Tour. If you stick with me for this long, thank you so much. And if you like what I'm doing, um, I ask you to subscribe and like and comment. That means a lot to me and helps me to build my channel and I'd really appreciate it. So I know the Woodland Garden isn't looking its finest, but at least you know what a Woodland Garden or my Woodland Garden looks like as um, the blooms and the flowers are dying back but also some really cool things in there like the jack in the pulpit seed heads and the woodland sunflower and some of those other cool things that are are coming up and making a little show i hope to see you all soon please comment let's have a conversation about native plants i love talking about native plants and if you're watching this video you probably do too <laughs> thank you